Section 13 of Astounding Stories, 14 February 1931, by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Black Lamp by Captain S. P. Meek. Part B. I've heard of you, Doctor, he said in a relieved tone, and I'll be glad to tell you everything. At ten o'clock last night I relieved Carragher as special guard over number 9764. Carragher reported that the prisoner was somewhat restless and hadn't been asleep as yet. I sat down about fifteen feet from his bed, and prepared to keep an eye on him, until I was relieved at six o'clock this morning. Nothing happened until about two o'clock. Number 9764 was restless, as Carragher had said, but toward midnight he quieted down and apparently went to sleep. I was sleepy myself, and I got up and took a turn around the room every five minutes to be sure that I kept awake. That's how I am sure of the time, sir. Dr. Bird nodded. At five minutes to two, just as I got up, I heard a noise outside like a big electric fan. It sounded like it came from directly overhead, and I went to the window and looked out. I couldn't see anything, although I could hear it pretty plainly. And then I heard a noise like something had fallen on the roof. Almost at the same time there came a sort of high-pitched whine, a good deal like the noise an electric motor makes when it is running at high speed. I thought of giving an alarm, but I didn't want to stir things up unless I was sure that there was some necessity for it, so I started for the door to ask one of the outside guards if he had heard anything. As I turned toward number 9764, I saw that he had been sitting up in bed while my back was turned. As soon as he saw that I noticed him, he lay back real quick and pulled the covers over his head. He moved pretty quick, but not so quick that I couldn't see that he had something that glittered like glass before his face. I started over toward his bed to see what he was doing, and then it was that the light started to get dim. "'Go on,' said the doctor, as Bailey paused. His eyes were glittering brightly now. "'Well, sir, doctor, I don't hardly know how to describe what happened next. The lights were getting dim, but not as they ordinarily do when the current starts to go off. The filaments were shining as bright as they ever did, but the light didn't seem to be able to penetrate the air.' The whole room seemed to be filled with a blackness that stopped the light. No, sir, it wasn't like fog. It was more like something more powerful than the lights was in the room and was killing them. It wasn't only the lights which were affected. It was me as well. This blackness, whatever it was, was getting into me as well as into the room, and I couldn't seem to make myself think like I wanted to. I tried to yell to give an alarm, and I found that I could hardly whisper. I went toward the bed, and then I saw number 9764 sit up again. He had a goldfish bowl pulled down over his head, and it was evident that it was keeping the blackness away, for I could see him plainly, and his eyes were as bright as ever. The nearer I got to him, the funnier I felt, and I began to be afraid that I would go out. Number 9764 got up out of bed, and I could see him grinning at me through the bowl. He reached up and adjusted that bowl, and all of a sudden I realized that whatever was knocking me out was not affecting him, because he had that thing on. I jumped for him with the idea of taking the bowl off and putting it on my own head. He saw what I was up to, and he fought like a cornered rat, but the blackness hadn't affected my muscles. I'm a pretty big man, sir, and number 9764 is a little runt, and it didn't take me long to get the bowl off his head and pulled on over mine. As soon as I did that, I seemed to be able to think clearer. I was sitting on number 9764 and was ready to tap him with a persuader if he started anything but I didn't have to. In a few minutes he stopped struggling and lay perfectly quiet. The lights kept getting dimmer and dimmer until they went out altogether and the room became pitch dark. It wasn't exactly as if the lights had gone out, sir. I seemed to know that they were still there and were burning bright as ever. But they couldn't penetrate the blackness in the room, if you understand what I mean. I think I do, said Dr. Bird slowly. It was a good deal as if you had seen a glass filled with a pale red liquid and someone had dumped black ink into the fluid and hid the red color. You would know that the red was still there, but you wouldn't be able to see it through the black. That's exactly what it was like, Doctor. You have described it better than I can. At any rate, after it got real dark I heard a low whistle from the roof. Number 9764 made a struggle to get up for a moment, and then lay quiet again. The whistle sounded again, and then I heard someone call Caruso. Everything was quiet for a while, and then the same voice called again and said some stuff in a foreign language that I couldn't understand. I kept perfectly quiet to see what would happen. 
For about ten minutes the room remained perfectly dark, as I have said, and all the while I could hear that whining noise. All of a sudden it began to sound in a lower note, and then I could see the lights again, very dimly, and like the black ink you spoke of was fading out. The note got lower until it stopped altogether, and the lights came on brighter until they were normal again. Then I heard a scraping noise on the roof, and the noise I had heard at first like a big electric fan. I looked at the clock. It was two-twenty. For a few minutes I wasn't able to collect my wits. When I got up off of number 9764 at last, he stared at me as though he didn't know a thing, and I heaved him back into his bed and ran to the door to summon an outside guard. I could still talk in a husky whisper, but not loud, and I wasn't surprised when no one heard me. My orders were not to let number 9764 out of my sight, but this was an emergency, so I left the ward and found a guard. It was Madigan, and he was standing on his beat staring at nothing. When I touched him he looked at me, and there was the same vacant look in his eyes that I had seen in the prisoners. I talked to him in a whisper, but he didn't seem to understand, so I left him and went to a telephone and called for help. Mr. Lawson, the warden, got here with guards in a couple of minutes, and I tried to tell him what had happened, but I couldn't talk loud, and I was afraid to take the fishbowl off my head. What happened next? Mr. Lawson took me to his office, and on the way we passed under an arc light. As soon as I got under it, I began to feel better, and my voice came stronger. I saw that it was doing me some good, and I stopped under it for an hour before my voice got back to normal. It seemed to clear the fog from my brain, too, and I was able, about four o'clock, to tell everything that had happened. Mr. Lawson seemed to think that my brain was affected as well as the others, and he sent me to the hospital. That's all, doctor. Do you feel perfectly normal now? Yes, sir. There is no need for confining this man longer, Mr. Lawson. He is as well as he ever was. Carnes? Get the Walter Reed Hospital on the telephone, and tell them that I said to treat Lieutenant Breslow with light rays, rich in ultraviolet. Tell them to give him an overdose of them, and not to put goggles on him. Keep him in the sun all day, and under sun-ray arcs at night, until further orders. Mr. Lawson, give the same treatment to the men who were disabled last night. If you haven't enough sun-ray arcs in your hospital, put them under an ordinary arc-light in the yard. Bailey, have you still got that goldfish bowl? It is in my office, doctor, said the warden. Good enough. Send for it at once. By the way, you have two more communists here, Denberg and Semensky, haven't you? I think so, although I will have to consult the records before I can be positive. I am sure you have. Look the matter up and let me know. The warden hurried away to carry out the doctor's orders, and an orderly appeared in a few moments with a hollow globe made of some crystalline, transparent substance. Despite its presence in the infirmary the evening before, there was no trace of clouding apparent. Dr. Bird took it and examined it critically. He wrapped it with his knuckles, and then stepped to the door and hurled it violently down on the concrete floor of the yard. The globe rebounded without injury, and he caught it. "'Vitrilene, or a good imitation of it,' he remarked to Carnes. "'After you get through talking to the hospital, get Taylor on the wire.' There is plenty of loose vitrilene in the bureau, and I want him to send down about fifty square feet of it, by a special plane, at once. As Carnes left the room, the warden reappeared. "'The men are all lying in the sun now, doctor,' he said. "'I find that we have the two men you mentioned confined here. They are both in Tier A, Building Six. "'Is that an isolated building? No, it is one wing of the old main building. On which floor? The second floor. It is a six-story building.' Have they been moved there recently? They have been there for nearly a year. In that case there will be little chance of another attack of this sort to-night. At the same time, I would advise you to station extra guards there to-night, and every night, until I notify you otherwise. Caution them to watch the lights carefully, and to give an alarm at once if they appear to get dim. In such a case, send men to the roof with rifles with orders to shoot to kill anyone they find there. I am going back to Washington and I am going to take Karuska, your number 9764, with me. You had better have one of the guards in the corridor, where Denberg and Semensky are, wear this goldfish bowl, as you call it. A lot of plate glass, at least it will look like that, will come from Washington by plane. Cut it into sheets a foot square, 
and use surgeon's plaster to make some temporary glass helmets for your men. I want all your guards to wear them until I either settle this matter, or else send you some better helmets. You understand? I understand all right, but I'm afraid I can't do it. The wearing of such appliances would interfere with the efficiency of my men as guards. Brain and tongue paralysis would interfere rather more seriously, it seems to me. In any event, I have sufficient authority to enforce my request. If you are at all doubtful, call up the Attorney General and ask him." The warden hesitated. "'If you don't mind, I think I will call Washington, doctor,' he said. "'I will have to get authority to turn number 9764 over to you in any event. Call all you wish, Mr. Lawson. Mr. Carnes is talking to Washington now, and we'll have a clear line through for you in a few minutes. Meanwhile, get a set of shackles on Karuska, and get him ready to travel by plane. He appears to be suffering from mental paralysis, but I don't know how his case will develop. He may go violently insane at any moment, and I don't care to be aloft in a plane with an unbound maniac." Major Martin looked up from the prone figure of Karuska. "'His condition duplicates that of Lieutenant Breslau, Dr. Bird,' he said. We received your telephoned message this afternoon, and we kept Breslau in a flood of sunlight until dusk, and then put him under sunray lamps. I don't know how you got on to that treatment, but it is having a very beneficial effect. He can already make inarticulate sounds, and his eyes are not quite as vacant as they were. If he keeps on improving as he has, he should be able to talk intelligently in a few days. If you wish to question this man, why not give him the same treatment? I haven't time, Major. I must make him talk to-night, if it is humanly possible. I called you in because you are the most eminent authority on the brain in the government service. Is there any way of artificially stimulating this man's brain, so that we can force the secrets of his subconscious mind from him?" The Major sat for a moment in profound thought. "'There is a way, Doctor,' he said at length. But it is a method which I would not dare to use. By applying high-frequency electrical stimulations to the medulla oblongata, at the same time bathing the cerebellum with ultraviolet, it might be done, but the chances are that either death or insanity would result. I would not do it. Major Martin, this man is a reckless and dangerous international criminal. If his gang carries out the plan which I fear they have formed, the lives of thousands, yes, of millions, may pay for your hesitation. I will assume full responsibility for the test, if you will make it, and I have the authority of the President of the United States behind me." "'In that case, Doctor, I have no choice. The President is the Commander-in-Chief of the Army, and if those are his orders, the experiment will be carried out. As a matter of form, I will ask that your orders be reduced to writing." "'I will write them gladly, Major. Please proceed with the experiment without delay.'" Major Martin bowed, and spoke to a waiting orderly. The prostrate figure of Karuska was wheeled down a corridor into the electrical laboratory, and with the aid of the laboratory technician the surgeon made his preparations. The moss lamp was arranged to throw a flood of ultraviolet over the Russian's cranium, while the leads from a deep therapy X-ray tube were connected, one to the front of Karuska's throat and another to the base of his brain. At a signal from the Major, a nurse began to administer ether. "'I guarantee nothing, Dr. Bird,' said the Major. The paralysis of the vocal cords may be physical, in which case the victim will still be unable to speak, regardless of the brain stimulation. If, however, the evident paralysis is due to some obscure influence on the brain, it may work. In any event, I will hold you blameless and thank you for your help," replied the doctor. Please start the stimulation. Major Martin closed a switch, and the hum of a high-tension alternator filled the laboratory. The Russian quivered for a moment, then lay still. Major Martin nodded, and Dr. Bird stepped to the side of the operating table. "'Ivan Karuska,' he said slowly and distinctly, "'do you hear me?' The Russian's lips quivered, and an unintelligible murmur came from them. "'Ivan Karuska,' repeated Dr. Bird, "'do you hear me?' There was a momentary struggle on the part of the Russian, and then a surprisingly clear voice came from his lips. "'I do.' Who is the present head of the Young Labor Party?" Again there was a pause before the name Saranoff came from the lips of the insensible figure. Carnes gave a sharp exclamation, but a gesture from the doctor silenced him. "'Is Saranoff alive?' "'Yes.' "'Is he in the United States?' "'No. 
He is in London. Is he coming to the United States? Yes. When? I don't know. Soon. As soon as we are ready for him. Where is he living in London? I don't know. How did you get word that you were to be rescued from Atlanta? A message was smuggled to me by O'Grady, a guard in our pay. What was that vitrilene helmet for? To protect me from the effects of the black lamp. What is the black lamp? I don't know exactly. Saranoff invented it. It gives a black light, and it kills all other light except sunlight, and it paralyzes the brain. Did you know that the model of the Breslau gun had been stolen? Yes. What were you going to do after you were rescued from jail? I was going to make a full-sized gun. We have a disappearing gun platform built in the swamps at the juncture of the Potomac and Piscataway Creek. The gun was to be mounted there, and we would shell Washington and institute a reign of terror. It would be a signal for uprisings all over the country. Is there a black lamp at that gun platform? Yes. The black lamp will kill both the flash and the report. Where did you get the formula for radite? We got it from one of Dr. Bird's assistants. His name— as he spoke the last few sentences, Karuska's voice had steadily risen almost to a shriek. As he endeavored to give the name of the doctor's treacherous helper, his voice changed to an unintelligible screech, and then died away into silence. Major Martin stepped forward and bent over the prone figure. Hurriedly he tore away the electrical connections, and placed a stethoscope over the Russian's heart. He listened for a moment, and then straightened up, his face pale. "'I hope the information you obtained is worth a life, Dr. Bird,' he said, his voice trembling slightly, "'because it has cost one. "'It may easily save thousands of lives. "'I thank you, Major, and I will see that no blame attaches to you for your actions. "'I only wish that he had lived long enough to tell me the name of my assistant who has sold me to Saranoff. "'However, we'll get that information in other ways. "'Carnes, telephone Lawson at Atlanta to slam O'Grady into a cell pending investigation, while I get Camp Meade on the wire and order up a couple of tanks. We are going to attack that gun emplacement at daybreak." The telephone bell in the laboratory jangled sharply. Major Martin answered it and turned to Carnes. "'You're wanted on the telephone, Mr. Carnes.' The detective stepped forward and took the transmitter. "'Carnes speaking,' he said. "'Yes. Oh, hello, Bolton. Yes, we have Karuska here, or rather his body. Yes, Dr. Bird is here right now. You've what? Great Scott, wait a minute. Dr. Bird, he cried eagerly, turning from the telephone, Bolton has located the Washington headquarters of the Young Labor Party. Dr. Bird sprang to the instrument. Bird speaking, Bolton, he cried. You've located their headquarters? Who's running it? Stanesky, eh? You're on the right track. You used to be Saranoff's right-hand man. Where is the place located? I don't seem to recollect the spot. You have it well surrounded? Where are you speaking from? All right, we'll join you as quickly as we can. Keep your patrols out, and don't let any one get away." He hung up the receiver and turned to Carnes. "'Did you have the car wait?' he asked. "'Good enough. We'll jump for the bureau, and pick up all the vitrilene lying around loose, and then join Bolton. He thinks that he has the whole outfit bottled up.' Bolton was waiting as the car rolled up, and Dr. Bird leaped out. "'Where are they?' demanded the doctor eagerly. "'In an abandoned factory building about three hundred yards from here,' replied the chief of the Secret Service. "'I traced them through New York. We have been watching the place ever since yesterday noon, and I know that Stanesky is in there with half a dozen others. No one has tried to leave since we set our watch. One funny thing has happened. About an hour ago a peculiar red glow suffused the whole building. It has died down a good deal since but we can still see it through the windows. Could you tell us what it means?" "'No, I couldn't, Bolton, but we'll find out. How many men have you?' "'I have sixteen stationed around. That's more than we'll need. I have only vitrilene shields and helmets enough to equip six men. Pick out your three best men to go with us, and we'll make a try at entering.' Bolton strode off into the darkness, and returned in a few moments with three men at his heels. 
Dr. Bird spoke briefly to the operatives, all of them men who had been his companions on other adventures. He explained the need for the vitrilene helmets and shields, and without comment the six donned their armor and followed Bolton as he strode toward the building. As they approached, a dull red glow could be plainly seen through the windows, and Dr. Bird paused and studied the phenomenon for a moment. "'I don't know what that means, Bolton,' he said softly, "'but I don't like the looks of it. Staneski is up to some devilment or other. I wouldn't be a bit surprised to find out that he knows all about your pickets and is ready for a raid. We'd better rush the place, then,' muttered Bolton. Dr. Bird nodded agreement, and with a sharp command to his men, Bolton broke into a run. Not a shot was fired as they approached, and the front door gave readily to Bolton's touch. As it opened, there came a grating sound from the roof, followed by the whir of a propeller. Dr. Bird ran out of the building and glanced up. "'A helicopter!' he cried. "'They were expecting us and have escaped.' He drew his pistol and fired ineffectually at the great bird-like ship which was rising almost noiselessly into the air. He cursed and turned again to the building. Bolton still stood in the room which they had first entered. His flashlight showed it to be empty, but from under a door on the opposite side a line of dull red light glowed evilly. With his pistol ready in his hand, Bolton approached the door on hands and knees. When he reached it he threw his shoulder against it and dropped flat to the floor as the door swung open. No shot greeted him, and he stared for a moment, and then rose to his feet. End of Part B. 